Hello, welcome to this lecture on resources-oriented sanitation. The outline. We are still in systems thinking. We are res uh, discussing resources-oriented sanitation as part of the overall system of uh, land, land use, agriculture, food production, water reproduction, restoration of degraded areas, and uh, making uh, reasonable water and sanitation systems for cities and for rural areas. So the, the outline is uh, getting the global mass flows right. So that is about uh, how uh, the, the actual uh, wastewater systems are dysfunctional if we see them in the long run. Uh, concepts and case studies, low tech. Uh, then uh, high-tech and a bit about sanitation and energy. So getting the global mass flows right, that's the first part we want to cover. And uh, if we look at a river in the city, uh, so we have a lot of um, industry and there are many um, houses, people are producing wastewater and a lot of this wastewater goes into this river and there something is wrong we get water food and energy the city is producing solid waste and wastewater and the wastewater goes uh, into the rivers still having a lot of the nutrients um, uh, even with very good treatment plants as they are today and we still have a lot of uh, pathogens uh, we, we still have microplastic and a lot of stuff in the effluent and uh, if we have one city polluting a river there may be another city downstream and there we have a problem in former days uh, this actually led to death this is the a book Death in Hamburg by uh, Richard Evans, historian. Um, it's not a, a crime story, but uh, basically the things that were happening were sort of a crime because politicians at that time didn't care about uh, filtering water, even though that was known at the time. They wanted to put all the resources and money into the harbor, into their businesses and uh, ultimately that almost killed uh, well their businesses and many of themselves and uh, the well wastewater in the river got uh, into the drinking water supply and uh, huge cholera epidemics uh, happened at that time and so uh, a lot of uh, dead people were carried out of the city and that was 1892. Um, uh, Rich, Jenk uh, Rich Jenkins has um, named this uh, the human nutrient cycle is broken and uh, this is something what I think is right and uh, my picture on this is that uh, flush sanitation has a fundamental flaw so we really do have uh, linear mass flows uh, we get food from the city uh, from the from the land into the city and then a lot of the nutrients are uh, polluting the water and only very little of the nutrients is reused at all more and more is going into incineration actually so nutrients are depleted on land, accumulated in water bodies by flush sanitation. Agrochemical in agriculture is wasting fossil resources and pollutes groundwater. And these fossil resources can partly uh, be replaced um, or all actually uh, can be replaced um, by proper reuse systems and proper systems of regenerative agriculture. Uh, the consequences uh, globally are visible now. Uh, the base of survival for future generation is heavily compromised. And that will mean that food water supplies are lost and the climate is 
uh, getting more and more out of balance through soil destruction and soil destruction is partly also happening because it's not well fed the humus is uh, reduced um, plants are lost vegetation cover is lost and uh, so the climate becomes very shaky and unbearable um, and these are the two scenarios so on one hand if we keep uh, life in soil we will have uh, abundance for nature and humans and on the other hand if we have the uh, nasty scenario where the soil is dying off uh, for a number of reasons um, the future uh, is uh, really compromised and um, my idea is to have a more balanced population between cities and rural areas making rural areas so attractive that also some of the people of the uh, densely urban, uh, urban uh, region would like to move out and also produce vegetables and thus they could take care of the soil uh, produce uh, food and the region can regenerate the water supply um, so how did all that start um, so flush sanitation is uh, very very old first mentions are thousands of years back and uh, the most well-known systems are those of the romans and they had the cloaca maxima so that was a very big uh, sewerage system where the wastewater was collected and transported out into the river and ultimately into the mediterranean sea and uh, that was sort of depleting uh, the land of nutrients because it went to the uh, to the seas instead of going back to the land but the romans uh, they probably had a system because these are pictures of uh, public toilets and uh, if you look at such a thing here uh, not explainable by male anatomy uh, by the sheer size of that but most probably these people were putting in uh, jars uh, and collected the urine because they knew about the value of urine and used that as a fertilizer remember by that time uh, the synthetic fertilizer uh, was not possible and so uh, that stuff was known for its value and uh, these may, might have been these jars and um, in modern times uh, this has come back so this is a pilot plant for fertilizer production from urine in the Netherlands and the Netherlands have started late with resources uh, um, oriented sanitation but then they really started many many projects partly also due to my work because I gave presentations in the Netherlands and afterwards they also implemented uh, things and they took also a lot of inspiration from the work that has been done in Sweden with uh, the urine diversion more, more about that later so innovation we do have uh, technical innovation uh, then we have the formal innovation that's what we mostly know um, that is like making things more beautiful and so on uh, but the forgotten part uh, and the one with the most potential is to come to new concepts and this is where we want to go today with this lecture looking into concept innovation okay let's get on the journey and uh, if we let look at wastewater and uh, not just assume wastewater is wastewater uh, we can easily find that on one hand we have a huge volume of uh, so-called grey water uh, so that would be 25,000 to 100,000 liters per person and year 
And uh, then if we look at uh, excreta, we see that uh, urine is a very small volume compared to that, just around 500 liters per person and day. Uh, and uh, the feces themselves even less, around 50 uh, uh, liters, uh, even wet mass. Flush water that could be saved is around 6,000 to 25,000 liters per uh, person and year. So if we find other solutions for this, that could be uh, saving a lot of water, making reuse of the gray water easier, and especially, and that's one of the main topics, recovering the nutrients from this fraction. And with this, uh, uh, that was a little bit too much here. Um, with this, uh, we can see that gray water doesn't have that many of the nutrients. So nitrogen, phosphate, potassium, the macronutrients are relatively low in the gray water, but very high in urine. And uh, also the excreta, they have a lot of the phosphate. And uh, so basically uh, the toilet uh, waste excreta, human excreta should be processed for fertilizer as a rule. Mixing the two makes both unusable, unreusable, and a water source for reuse is lost because if excreta is in there, reuse is very difficult, very nasty, also psychologically not really easy. And so this is something that uh, hasn't worked out very well and that needs to be changed sometime in future if there should be a good future for all what i propose very much um, so let's uh, see there would be even earnings in this and um, uh, if we look into these systems um, we could well find ways of separating the two in fact it's not necessary uh, to connect toilets to the uh, rest of the wastewater, only flush toilets that are using very, very much water make this necessary. Uh, so industry had the same systems as cities have today. So they had uh, these central uh, treatment plants and of the pipe treatment uh, they found that it's very costly, wastes a lot of water that is sometimes not available. Companies need to be closed down when uh, there is a big drought. And so they moved into reuse systems, reuse at each production unit. So looking at the different concentrations uh, of nutrients and everything. And with that, uh, they would sort of uh, find ways of recovering substances, saving lots of water. Uh, and so you see the water consumption is much less and the effluent wastewater, the fees for that are much less. And even very often they have created systems without any wastewater being out of the, that legislation. It is possible for many industrial branches. And now the question is, can the same work in housing areas? And well, my work over the last 30 years has conclusively shown it is possible and there are even many, many systems possible. Not all of them are good, but that's uh, where we get. So toilet systems with uh, little or no dilution, source separation. So we always, if we want to go for better um, sanitation systems make a barrier here so that should never be mixed that's uh, first step toilets that are uh, there we would have um, the normal flush toilet far too much dilution too much water wastage and not possible uh, the Vacuum toilets, that was my starting point for developing new systems. There is only around nine liters of uh, excreta with flush water. 
from Sweden, the development of the separating toilets in uh, modern times was done. Urine has most of the liquid um, or soluble nutrients, so that would be uh, collectible. Waterless urinals go the same way. And then there are composting or desiccation toilets. And these uh, use no water or very, very tiny fractions for, for cleansing. And then what we have developed in as well, one of the major systems are container toilets that have a very low dilution. They go into lactic acid fermentation and the excreta are collected via vacuum trucks like solid waste management. We have shown beyond any doubt that this is possible even in densely populated cities at low prices and um, that's one way to go forward. Um, so yeah, that would be uh, a way of having uh, a flush toilet. So if we want to go with flush toilets, the um, toilet should be in a closed loop and the flush water should be reproduced from the system itself. All right, uh, that was the first uh, point. Now we get into concepts and case studies of low-tech systems. A lot of the world needs low-tech because the high-tech expensive systems are not available anywhere uh, or everywhere. And uh, the sewage systems are very, very expensive. Uh, 80 to 90 percent of the total investment into wastewater infrastructure goes into transportation alone, transporting the wastewater from a place where it could be easily reused because the demand is always there. Uh, it is transported to a place where it becomes a nuisance and polluting rivers and so on. So that doesn't make too much sense. And um, low-tech options are available, but not all of them are suitable everywhere. And I want to go into detail a little bit here. So. There are ancient systems that have done source control, so it's not a modern thing. So people were clever also a long time ago, and uh, some cultures were probably much advanced, much more advanced than we were, as uh, old findings, old uh, excavations have shown. Uh, and so. This was a toilet, uh, you see the squat toilet, that's the hole for the excreta here. And urine, while a person is squatting, would go out here. And the funny thing in this system uh, is that the urine was flowing out and flowing down, not onto the person, hopefully, um, but uh, it would be flowing down. And this, is this very, very dry uh, region, it would just... Uh, dry out, evaporating. Um, I don't know about the smells. Could have been a smelly system, um, but probably not too much because they knew how to put the chemistry right. And when this is uh, drying very fast, uh, this would be uh, working out well. Uh, see that there is a uh, washing place and uh, you should know with respect to sanitation, around half the world population is using water for anal cleansing. The other half of the world population is using paper. And uh, both are, uh, well, thinking uh, that the systems of the others is disgusting. Uh, in my point of view, both are disgusting. So bare hands with water is disgusting and uh, dry paper is, well, sort of disgusting and, and uh, causing medical problems in the uh, anus and uh, so wet uh, towels and uh, something like that uh, would be more suitable. Um, all right, so that would be where the two cultures could meet and they actually do in mixed couples from the different backgrounds. <laughs> all right, so um, then, um, in 19, 1896, uh, there was Gehring's uh, Torfmüll 
uh, toilet in um, Germany and also urine urine diversion and so urine could be um, collected for reuse and that was the idea people knew that at that time and so excreta would fall down in this shaft and from here there would be uh, some um, peat uh, brought in and it would be added automatically when you would close the lid. All right, uh, unfortunately development went another direction, uh, not the least because building sewerage systems was very big business and so there was um, uh, a big push by uh, those in that business because they could really earn lots of money so it was not so much a conscious decision uh, for what is better but more or less for where people could earn money people that had um, well good connections to those in power and um, so in modern days these old systems were uh, taken up again and there are some examples now of dry toilets with urine diversion uh, there is the great book uh, of uh, Ray et al uh, ecological sanitation free download um, the link is here so see that in the download i'll take this away so those of you who want to see that. Uh, the principle is that there is a um, urine diversion in front of this and this goes to a tank outside um, and uh, for excreta there is a desiccation chamber and uh, after around 6 uh, to 12 months uh, the toilet is uh, changed so it would be uh, put to the other side then and uh, then this new heap would start and that one could be uh, rotting desiccation could be taken out and uh, in Sweden uh, such systems were developed in a, a nicer form uh, resembling the flush toilet so they had a sort of flush system with sawdust, uh, a closing system and uh, in the front of the toilet urine diversion so that the stuff could be collected um, uh, dry. This is the work by Arne Rosmarine from uh, Eco Sunres, uh, SEI, Stockholm Environment Institute. They were leading in this field for a long time and uh, other development from China. There is this um, squat toilet, feces chamber and urine in front. And um, so there is uh, sawdust added. And this is uh, from a project uh, of WECF, Women in Europe, uh, in cooperation with my institute at that time. We've done a lot of work together in Eastern European countries and this type of toilet is installed there in quite a few places. Um, water conservation is always part of that so while we want to reuse um, the water it is also good to reduce the uh, volume of water that is needed. Um, that was actually a slide in the wrong place if you, as you may have uh, realized but uh, makes sense in this place as well. Uh, so this was a, a project I did uh, for uh, GTZ, uh, German Technology Corporation, uh, many years back, maybe 20 years back and I was uh, building a Ecosun toilet in uh, Mali, West Africa and uh, this is the uh, faces chamber also two chambers i took these ideas from the swedish and from the mexican earth toilet 
and behind this wall there is the toilet and uh, there is uh, the squat toilet and uh, we wanted to do evaporation and drying for the urine uh, what didn't really work out very well because uh, it got too or kept too moist in the in the rainy season so that part didn't work well but um, the toilet in, in itself would work so urine would have to be collected um, this type of toilets uh, dry urine diversion toilets actually were also uh, built in a larger scale in inner mongolia so this is a project that was done there also by sei the toilet uh, i've shown you before was installed they had these falling shafts and of course it's a headache for the architects to have all these falling shafts that must be uh, vertical uh, and uh, so that's something where you have a lot of space uh, needed unfortunately this project was a failure with uh, many wrong connections of the uh, vent pipes uh, that that whole system was too smelly people didn't accept this anymore and even trials to uh, repair that was not, were not working out so the system was uh, well taken out and flush toilets came in and uh, that's too sad because inner mongolia is one of the driest regions of the world the water for flush toilets is simply not available in the long run and so when uh, water is uh, getting short uh, droughts are hitting flush toilets will fail and that's an utter disaster and then people start building pit latrines in front of modern houses so that's what at least what i've seen in ethiopia and that may happen in this or may have happened in that place as well um yeah this toilet again and uh well yeah now uh, i come to a system um that we have developed and what i think is uh, solving a lot of the problems that urine diversion dry toilets still have i have visited many many toilet projects around the world i've been involved in projects uh, did designs in several countries around the world uh, african countries southeast asia and uh, so i've seen many projects that were sort of okay but not really really good and it must be really really good to go to scale and so after a while i got frustrated with urine diversion dry toilets and uh, so i wanted to have um, another way of uh, low-tech low-cost sanitation and luckily i uh, met uh, people who had the idea of uh, what we call terra preta sanitation inspired by the indios of uh, the amazon uh, what is today brazil and they probably had historic toilets with uh, lactic acid fermentation that's a hypothesis of uh, dr heiko piplo uh, w missing sorry um, of the german ministry of the environment and he concluded that seeing such things in uh, the region with uh, like excavations uh, it seems that there were jars in that place and uh, they might have had a an opening uh, below and so that may have been a toilet at the time and uh, that would have to be inductic acid fermentation for not being too smelly and when i heard about this so the idea came from uh, dr jürgen rakin and dr heiko piplo based on uh, excavations in the amazon and they concluded that this type of uh, sanitation system was done at that time so we tried to find something to make a toilet system uh, that is actually helping to convert this barren soil below the rainforest the soil is normally washed out over millennia and nothing much grows there except for the dense rainforest that lives above soil mostly 
uh, but these Indios from thousands of years back until uh, around 500 years back, they were able to build soil that is really dark and fertile. And even 500 years after these people were sadly uh, destroyed, um, this soil is still very fertile. People living on Tarapita are happy, they have a good life, they have to work very little, everything's growing well. And people that uh, live on this conventional soil have a, a life of hardship and uh, barely uh, getting a harvest, even if they buy mineral fertilizer. So uh, the black color comes from uh, mixing the compost of, uh, well, like uh, the, the, the waste of food waste, um, then uh, garden clippings and also excreta and bones and everything. Uh, that compost was mixed with uh, some fine ground charcoal and that made this black long lasting soil. It's not conclusively uh, resolved how this could work so well, uh, but we see the evidence. So this system is proven over thousands of years, basically. And so when I heard about that, I wanted to do something that makes this uh, same fantastic system that is so advanced above our nonsense uh, to, to make this acceptable for modern days. And so we came up with a, a toilet design uh, that was done by Sabine Schober, uh, industrial designer from Hamburg. And she developed this uh, type of model. We had a competition running. We had uh, $50,000 available for uh, price and development of a, a animation video that is available online look for Terapeuta sanitation and you'll find that. And uh, this is a toilet that is basically, this is the container. And so this, um, this thing where people can put their feet for squatting uh, is a holding tank for Equita for a whole family and a week at the same time. And uh, lactic acid uh, bacteria are added and uh, the downside of the system it needs some sugar it should be waste sugar but it's two to three uh, kilograms actually per person and year and um, then the cleansing of this toilet so it's not a completely dry toilet um, when you open this there is um, sort of a a cover and um, so lactic acid bacteria is preventing the smell so the closing off is very hygienic because insects cannot go in there and people cannot look inside because that's something uh, people hate including myself and uh, then uh, Cleansing can be done with a spray bottle or with a spray shower. So this is the thing that is visible here to the side. And then tank transport or suction truck or a macerator pump or uh, well making it fall into a, a bigger tank down here. So there would be the toilets and every week or so when enough volume is collected uh, this stuff would be flushed down and this intermediate tank would be emptied uh, maybe every uh, two to three months, whatever the volume is. And uh, uh, in sink aerator, in sink grinder could be used for grinding the bio waste. So the kitchen waste would be added to the system and can be enough sugar for the lactic acid fermentation. So that would help to keep the system in uh, lactic acid fermentation. Uh, this is possible in urban areas and uh, we have done um, experiments um, on uh, composting. So these were sort of experimental composting beds 
and uh, so this material was converted to uh, what we could call modern terrapeta. Of course, it's not terrapeta do indio, but it's uh, terrapeta black soil um, in, a, in a modern form. And this would be such compost, and that could feed the soil. The humus would be building up, and the water generation, regeneration could be kept intact. So this is far reaching. And compared to uh, humus fodder from agriculture, from cover crops, from manure, from cattle in uh, holistic grand play, uh, plant grazing, rotational grazing. Humans only can contribute globally around maybe around 10% of the um, um, soil fodder nutrients, uh, but it's an important part because humans. Uh, have a lot of uh, trace elements that they need. They need to be recovered. Zinc may be disappearing over the next 20 years already. And without zinc, um, well, life is not really possible in the long run. And so that's uh, something where we need to recover this material from excreta. And uh, so that's part of the idea behind the system. So back to the original idea of uh, well the linear mass flows of conventional sanitation that does not work out in the long run uh, some things can be done to work with this type of system so we could have a system where we would take the whole wastewater flow from conventional sanitation including excreta and all wastewater to reuse on land and that could be wastewater forests. Doesn't really work out in northern climates, but in um, tropical, subtropical areas without a strong winter season or without a winter season, uh, that could be working year round. And we have done uh, extensive research on bamboo um, wastewater systems. Um, one company that did this was uh, Futurem from France. So what you see on this picture is actually one of their wastewater treatment plants. It's a beautiful one, isn't it? But it's not only beautiful, but it's producing massive amounts of, of biomass, of usable biomass for fuel, for construction material. Uh, the leafy material could make great compost and so on. And um, this system uh, the wastewater is distributed here. Uh, the bamboo grows really well, and bamboo, being a grass, takes up lots of uh, nutrients, and that makes it very suitable for wastewater treatment. And we do, we've done an experiment on this, um, and uh, so that's uh, the researcher there. This is Nzana from Cameroon, who has done this research as a doctorate. And uh, we've even built a small system in Hamburg. And um, this is something that uh, could be working much better in more, uh, uh, well, countries with more solar radiation. It's, it's not enough in Germany. And actually at TOHH, we have a small wastewater system with bamboo uh, behind building M. So um, then also compatible with conventional sanitation would be uh, the urine collection in conventional flush uh, toilets. This is actually a picture from a house that I once uh, well rebuilt and I've put that in for getting some experience by myself. And the system basically works for uh, quite a while, a few years, but it's sort of not really working well in the long run. So these systems tend to fail, but could be improved and that would be a way to process urine for fertilizer. And we have constructed a system uh, based on urine diversion uh, for Linz in Austria. My former consultancy uh, did this uh, and uh, so 
the system there did a lot of urine collection and the idea was to reuse that as fertilizer. All right, so that's um, the part <coughs> of concepts and case studies on low tech. I hope you uh, got the idea of that. And that's the end of the first part of this video and I will come back in um, the next video then. Thank you for listening.